welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Our guest is Michaeline Friedenberg, author of Grief and Abortion, Creating a Safe Place to Heal. And welcome, Michaeline. Great to have you here on EWTN's here. Uh, Bookmark once again. I know we talked in the past, and of course, people watching us today would remember you were back in November. Uh, on Jim and Joy show, mm -hmm. and ha you've shown up uh, also on Women of Grace, so uh, yes. people can look for you on that. Now, this is—is is this your second book? Then you worked on? Uh, yes, it is. So the first book was changed, which is specifically for men, women, and family members impacted by abortion. Mm -hmm. And then grief and abortion. Um, actually, had the honor of working with the team, so I was the editor for the book and then did write the introduction as well. Right, there's four different people in mm -hmm. here, Linda Ramos-Stewart, Dr. Gary H. Strauss, and Moira Gohl. I uh, hope they pronounced all their names correctly, mm -hmm. but they, uh, so how did you come together with them and what was the idea of doing something that's kind of referred to in the beginning book as connecting the dots? Yes. Well, we began to be asked by different um, professionals, leaders, to have some help. They wanted to know uh, how can we help those who we may be in contact with who have had a past abortion. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the idea of actually putting together a book that would help to guide them. And the reason that we called it Connecting the Dots is because we believe that most people already have a lot of tools that they could help someone who's hurting after an abortion. But because we don't talk about it and mm -hmm. we rarely hear people's stories, we feel like we're ill-equipped. So we felt that giving them information about grief and loss and then what the healing process looks like would help them to already take maybe their past education and their experience and be able to put mm -hmm. that together to feel like they're equipped to help others. Now right in the beginning of the book you say, for years I've been troubled by how Abortion experiences are characterized in the abortion debate. How so? Well, I, I think often, well, we don't hear many s personal stories about abortion, but when we do, it tends to be the narrative of extremes, okay. meaning either you hear stories of empowerment or you hear stories of devastation. Mm -hmm. And where that's true for some people, for most who are impacted by abortion, their experience is somewhere else along the continuum. And so for them, again, it feels like they're all alone, mm -hmm. that there's nobody else who's experiencing what they are. Right, so it's either that kind of thing that it's a horrific situation and maybe somebody comes out of it and now is leading the charge right. or somebody else who says like you say Jane told me she didn't regret her abortion and she didn't appear to dwell on her experiences either but didn't you say nevertheless Jane shared with me that her boyfriend allowed her to go through the procedure alone and then sent her flowers afterwards he sent me flowers can you believe it so she's probably hurting more than she's letting on mm -hmm. but she's not like some major feminist who's saying well I did this and my abortion, see it worked out wonderfully for me, look at this great right. career or whatever, I've always been happy after that. Well, I think when you've had such a significant life experience like going through an abortion, the last thing you want is to feel that someone would be taking your experience and using it for their agenda. Mm -hmm. And that I think too kind of keeps people quiet. And I think also there's confusion. So because we paint it very black and white, um, what if I have mixed emotions, like Jane? Mm -hmm. So there's a part of me that doesn't regret it, and then there's another part of me that has a lot of pain and was never allowed a place to process it. But what do you do with that? It's, I think it's very confusing for individuals. You say, what about the person who's coping well until some life event occurs years or even decades later, thereby triggering a troubling response? So you've, you've seen that as well. Absolutely, and it, it can be a number of reasons, but there's a, a woman who comes to mind, spoke to me uh, after she heard me speak at a church service, and she said she had her abortion when she was 25. She coped with it well, really didn't think about it until the last few years. Now she's nearing 40. Mm -hmm. She really wants to be a mother, but she wants to be married first. She said there's no guy in the horizon. And so suddenly that abortion mm -hmm. is for her becoming a real loss of that child. And then not only that particular child, but perhaps the loss of her ability to become a mother. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, your teenage son uh, commented, uh, brought a very you know, interesting point. He says, experiences are from individuals and they need to be looked at individually. When did that conversation come up when he made that point to you? It was actually when we were working on the, the book together and he was very aware of, of the process and was talking just about that, just the uniqueness of experiences and where people fall along the spectrum. And that's where he just spoke up and he said, yes, because we're all individuals. 
we're all unique. And I think that can be the challenge of being able to accept someone right where they're at and not project and put on them maybe what we think that they should be feeling about this. So we have to be careful about even best intentions of coming up with cookie cutter programs that are designed Absolutely. to work for everybody, right? In fact, you have an email later on on that page where you talk about this woman at the end's concluded her email by saying, it is important for people to know that there is no quote unquote post-abortion syndrome, okay? The truth is all of the symptoms and feelings are natural and normal. It's interesting to, to define that as saying it's a different way of looking at what people mean by the syndrome, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think the reason why I included that in is because we've definitely noticed that an obstacle for someone reaching out for help is if they feel that they're going to have a label put on them, mm -hmm. and in particular, a label that defines them by their abortion. So they're grieving the loss of this child. Often there's other losses that are involved. Maybe the relationship was lost in this. Um, perhaps there are spiritual repercussions mm -hmm. for them. And so for them, they're thinking about, and they kind of define themselves by their abortion. They certainly then don't want somebody else to define them by that. I think also, mm -hmm. you know, what they're going through after the abortion as they're struggling is something that would be would be natural and normal for them. And that's actually a really important message to say that what you're going through is normal. Mm -hmm. um, you're going through a grieving process. Um, perhaps they're on a quest for forgiveness. Um, and so there's a way for them to go and a path for them to find wholeness and healing. At the same time, it, it, for some people, it must be helpful to realize, A, you're not alone, and it's not unusual, and which is where I guess the syndrome comes in, mm -hmm. to say, yes, you might have certain different experiences, mm -hmm. but at the same time, there may be a lot of overlap in the way people tend to respond, like you talk about depression or other things that show up, right? Right, well, and certainly there's, again, it's unique the way that we go through mm -hmm. it, but certainly there are similarities as well. So sadness, anniversary mm -hmm. reactions, sometimes having difficulty bonding um, with others. Right. And also you've got here, this is really designed to help people who are involved with trying to help others yes. deal with abortion, the post-abortion thing. So, so it's really helpful for them uh, to have a book like this that brings together this kind of advice for people who already realize that I want to help this person who had an abortion. I want to help other people who have suffered through this. But I need to, like you say, understand what's the right way to go about it and to realize I have to treat each person as an individual. I also noticed you, you mentioned the point uh, First, you've got abortion helped me go to college and fulfill my dreams. Life would be no, no, so much harder had I kept the baby. I simply can't support one. So you run into people that that's what they're telling themselves and that's where they are today. Mm -hmm. Maybe that'll change later or maybe yes. they're not being honest with themselves. But there's also, and I was wondering how much of this you see today. I'm convinced my 15-year-old daughter to get an abortion. Now I feel so guilty, mm. uh, especially as I see it affecting her. Yes. Are we dealing with a lot of, uh, let's say, post-abortion? parents in a sense, yeah. parents who pressured their children to, to have an abortion mm -hmm. now and are either having their own remorse because their own guilt involvement or like they mm -hmm. said here as well as seeing the suffering now that their child went through because of this? Right, and I think we, we often don't think about that. We think about the woman involved. Sometimes we don't even think about the man who was involved. But then family members and friends are certainly impacted. And in that situation she's describing, it's not uncommon when you have a young teen, someone who's still in high school, the family kind of panics. Mm -hmm. They want to help and they feel that this is the way to help their teenager. And then when they see the teenager not coping well, that guilt can increase, or perhaps it's just something in time when it begin, they begin to realize, oh my goodness, this was a grandchild. I participated in this, and it's really difficult to cope. And often with the family, they'll make the decision and they'll never talk about it again. Mm -hmm. And so it just kind of sits there and festers. Yeah, and, uh, like the elephant in the room, mm -hmm. uh, the unspoken truth that's there. Now, one of the things you do point out is that you say, as you get into the beginning of the book, you say, a reminder to review, before you read on, please read the book, Change. Now, that's your original book, right? Yes. Why is it important in your mind that, that you read that book before you really mm -hmm. deal with this book? Yeah, there, there are two reasons. One of them, because the, the book Change starts with many different stories um, coming from men, women, family members, and friends. And so to 
because as I said, not many people talk about their personal experiences, just being able to have a better understanding right. of what someone might be going through is really gonna help them to understand the content of the rest of the book. Um, also then that moves into the healing pathways. And so looking at it through the eyes of someone who's hurting who would be moving through the healing pathways would again really help them then for the content in this book I think to really come alive and help them to connect the dots to be able to effectively help others. Now you also talk about and it's in fact it's in your subtitle creating a safe place to heal. What, what do you mean by a safe place to heal? Yes. Well, there, when it comes to abortion, and with partic particularly with personal experiences, for most people, they don't, they don't feel very safe. Um, perhaps it's their own maybe shame and guilt that they're feeling, their sense of isolation. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of fear of what happens if I share this with someone. Of being judged. Absolutely, and I remember that myself. I remember thinking, well, if I share with those friends who I know support abortion, then maybe they're gonna minimize what I'm going through. But if I share with those who I know are opposed to abortion, I really feared their judgment. And then I just didn't want people mm -hmm. to relate to me differently and think about me differently. And I, I hear that often of this fear of reaching out, for, out to others. And so it's almost like we have to go up and beyond to try to create places of safety so an individual would know that they're not going to receive judgment they're going to be met with support and compassion and someone who's going to be helping them. In a sense, what the present Holy Father is talking about, that, that whole idea of encounter and accompaniment, which yes. is to meet the person where they are, but don't, don't leave them there, but help them to, to find their way back, right? Yes. Now, also in the book, you talk about things like, in a safe place, this was, a, tens, uh, teens tend to relate better to other teens with similar experience, adults who have been there. And, and why is that important for people to know? Uh, you know, because maybe I, I'm, you know, or somebody's talking to somebody and they say, well, you, do you never had an abortion. You were never in my situation. So how do you relate? Right. And that's, that's really part of the, the premise of the book because we take a grief and loss approach. And so although you may not have experienced an abortion, you have experienced other losses in your life. And so there's so much similarity that's there that you already have a place where you can go to to relate. And you probably already have a pretty good idea of what's helpful and not helpful as you're moving through the grieving process. One of the things you point out here too is include the use of the word pregnancy loss, uh, using that term, and also avoiding using words or phrases associated with politics or debate. These types of words don't value people and their real experiences. And then you also mentioned the fact here, this struck me, don't try to force healing. What do you mean? <laughs> well, I think that for most individuals, we, when we're we encounter someone in great pain, what do we want to do? We want to help to alleviate their pain. And so sometimes in our own compassion and enthusiasm to make that happen, we're trying to push that person before they're ready to. Ready to. So I think it's so important to realize that in the same way that our experience is unique, the way that we heal will be unique. And so to allow that person the amount of time and space that they need, which can be really challenging because we want it to get better for them. And yet, Simply being there with them, listening to them, and encouraging them is a huge gift, and they right. will be making progress. Right, and that's tough in the world we live in where things move so quickly, and we are just out of time. Thank you so much. Okay. Michaeline Friedenberg, Thanks. author of Grief and Abortion, Creating a Safe Place to Heal, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. Here with Rob Guinan, author of Anne Among Us, First Fear, Then Miscarriage, A Catholic Father's Diary. And uh, welcome you. to Bookmark. Pleased to be here. Nice to have you here, Rob. And people would have seen you on Jim and Joy Pinto's program as well. That's and that, right. And, uh, and one of the things, your connections that uh, made me want to talk to you was your good friends with Chris Bell. You know, Very good friends. <laughs> and he and his wife, as far as I'm concerned, are saints, uh, certainly saints in the making, and do wonderful work uh, with unwed mothers. And here you are talking about an unplanned pregnancy as a man. Now, who is Anne? You, you, know, you know, people would hear Anne among us, they think, is he talking about St. Anne? In some ways, maybe you are, but maybe not the way people think about it. it it's from, from three uh, sources, really. Both of our grandparents were named Anne, and then we both loved Elizabeth Ann Seton because we were 
doing the homeschooling and we, you know, watched that movie over and over again with uh, Kate Mulgrew right, and right, I uh, remember, right, yeah. just had a connection there, you know, and it's a, it, we've never agreed quickly on a name and it, it almost came instantaneously right. when, we, when we were discussing this pregnancy, you know. Right, which ended in a miscarriage. It did, yes. And what, what was powerful about that for you? Because in the very beginning you talk about, I know we experience people through their presence, but with you, and you're talking to Anne, it seems I feel you through your absence. And then you go to talk about uh, Paul's letter to Philemon. What's the connection I, there? I was very uncharitable with this whole thing. My mother had leukemia. We also had, um, I mean, everything was going wrong. Even the chimney was, was crumbling at that mm -hmm. time. And, uh, and then my wife said on the way home from the hospital visiting my mother, she said, um, you know, I think I might be pregnant. And I, w I had like, such a, a terrible attitude. We went to Walgreens and we went and um, we, we had to go through the seats. Of Got the, one of those tests. Things yeah, we, we were digging through the seats of the car just to be able to pay for it. Really? We got back home and it, there was a plus. Mm -hmm. And we just looked at each other, especially me, and said, I can't, Lord, save us from this stupidity, you know. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't, we, we really didn't even pay any attention to our natural family planning. We, we were busy thinking about other things yeah, besides that. Yeah, too many that. other things going on. And you already yeah. had, what, three kids? Three kids, yeah. Okay. And, and so, you were very pro-life. It wasn't that you weren't open to life in general. But this yeah. hit you at a bad time. I don't know if I was an award-winning Christian at this right. point in my right. life, but uh, I, you know, the, she went to the OBGYN and I didn't even um, go with her for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I just had such a, uh, just a real bad attitude about being charitable and, and you know, opening things up there and discussing, being excited, right. you know, right. being excited. Everybody else would be excited right. about a new yeah. life and I could just see the problems. One of the right. good images is that it's like seeing a shadow of a mouse mm -hmm. on a wall. I was seeing a T-Rex on the wall. You know, okay, it's like, right. it's totally irrational. Right. Now you mentioned at the beginning Philemon. What, what is the connection there, Philemon, about the, uh, the slave, et cetera? Well, um, Paul asked Onesimus to take him, uh, I mean, Paul asked Philemon to take Onesimus back, not, not as a thief, but as a, a friend. And Even went, though he had run away and, and possibly and stolen, stolen from, from him. him. Right. Yeah. I, I, I was asked to receive this innocent little child who, who offered nothing but good things. And uh, I just, I had, uh, you know, I just, no charity there. I mean, right, just, the, right. just feeling the heat of all the things around it. Because everything point. was fall, you know, you talked about having multiple layoffs between several years. Obviously, if you're sitting there going through the seats looking for change, yeah. uh, <laughs> money was tight. Yeah. And, and so, like you talk about it, the idea of an unplanned pregnancy. You also said, when I went to bed at night and offered up my regular prayers for our three children, uh, a terrible disposition took place. I, took shape. I had begun to slight this innocent child. I'm ashamed to admit this, but it actually took me three weeks to start praying for this little child. I'm, I feel such shame for that. I, you know, it, uh, it's like saying no room at the inn, you know, it's just... Right. Yeah. Did you also th contemplate adoption as a possibility? Because I think you talk about that in the book, or at least at one point well, it checked into whether that was even a viable option for you at the time? Obviously abortion wasn't an right. issue, but right. Adoption surely was because we're just trying to get rid of a, unfortunately to say, a problem. Mm -hmm. But um, so you I, could have a, a lot of sympathy in some ways for people who are faced with this, young women who have the same absolutely, thing. Absolutely, absolutely. Right? Yeah. I went to a great priest in Hartford, um, Father Russo, and uh, we talked about all the issues, even about an older adoption. Like you know, his parents were like I think his parents were forty-five when he was born, mm -hmm. and. Um, I, I just uh, went through all the things with him, and then finally, as I was walking out the door, he, he played kind of a cute little trick. He, he said, Rob, before you ado decide on adoption, um, just wait till you see the baby's face. Right. I thought, you, you really are good. <laughs> You're really good at this, Father Rousseau, you know? And, and that- Well, because there's an instant connection that happens Absolutely, too, yeah. And it's real. Yeah. You know, and then you realize that, uh, you know, it's gonna, maybe it's gonna be tough, but somehow we'll, God will make it work out. Abs yeah, that, that's really, and we came together then and we were ready for the next step. And um, Now you also say here, uh, you know, the questions of life and death were taken from us. All of a sudden it didn't matter what we thought. 
which we always like to think we're in control. Absolutely. We're deciding what's going on. The situation no longer ours to plot, to determine, or strategize. Enter the cross, and that's when you found out what? The miscarriage was, was imminent. She had begun to start to spot. So you knew about it ahead of time before what didn't just, wasn't spontaneous without knowing was you actually had been told this is going to happen. They said that, they, they always try to couch it a little bit. They say probably, but don't, don't worry about it, you know. And what amazed me about my wife, who another person that really educated me is that she, uh, I caught her one night in the kitchen. She didn't know that I'd gone upstairs and she was taking the pre, prenatal vitamins all the way to the end, even no matter what, even what the doctor said, she was gonna go right to the last minute to throw a rope line to this beautiful child, you know, and uh, I thought that was really a statement on her part. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you talk about in here the, the idea of saying to yourself, was it a test from God? Do I really believe what I profess? I think that's a lot of things that are the challenges to us yeah. when, we, when all of a sudden, uh, you know, things get tougher uh, especially in the kind of com comfortable Catholic culture we live in sometimes. Yeah. And you also said she taught me about my faith and even more about myself. What did you learn about yourself from this experience? Well, you know, you, you can go to church on Sunday feeling you're, like you're a professional Christian and, uh, you know, you could educate all these other people there. I found out that I, that I wasn't really in that great a shape. I found out that, you know, I needed to... It didn't take much. It, yeah, it didn't take much. <laughs> to, to kind of put yeah. you questioning what you claim to believe, right? Yeah. I, I thought this was a great quote. You said, quite honestly, I did in some way say no room at the end. Absolutely. Yeah. That's an interesting way of thinking about it, obviously, especially, yeah. And, but then you talk about kind of building this relationship with your daughter, who you named Anne. Yeah. Um, and, and the idea that you, you kind of built the relationship after she was gone, but it's as if she's not gone. And you, you talk about one of your, your son, Matthew, bringing it up, yeah. right? Well, thank you for saying that. He, he prayed, you know, as a writer, you get a little bit of an ego. Yeah, yeah I wrote a good, good story here, isn't this great? But the thing is, he never let it die. He, he spoke to me as well at, at eight years old. In our nightly prayers, he never, stopped praying for her all the way up till the time he went to college. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so he he saw her, sort of brought me to a newer place, mm -hmm. whereas I wanted to know more about her. I wanted to um, know about this life that we just lost and how I could somehow have some kind of relationship with this child. Mm -hmm. And Did you feel in some ways you were trying to make up for what had happened when she, before her passing? At first I would have said that, but it, it really was, I was a little, little bit slow on the coin there because mm -hmm. even that was a lot later. Mm -hmm. But I, when I offered my first masses for her, I felt like a, a flood of happiness. I, really? I okay. just couldn't be happier. And Because uh, um, uh, you say, what do I know about Anne? What can I know about her? I know that she was able to get my attention in a major way as precious few have. How did she get your attention? My wife, when we married, she wasn't Catholic, and, but she loved all the Catholic stuff. And she went to RCIA with Father Anthony Moore, who was a, a very close friend of Father Benedict Rochelle. Okay. And um, all of a memory. sudden, yeah. after this life, she, after this, um, this thing, she wanted to become Catholic. Mm -hmm. she, she sort of liked being on the sidelines with Catholicism and liking a lot of things about it. but. Uh, and I, I was never pushy, but mm -hmm. she was dead set ahead, again, it's 100 miles ahead, she wanted to become Catholic. And I think it's because she shared some of the pain that this little child mm -hmm. with, with, within her. And for myself, um, I, I think it's she just really reawakened a faith right. that was dying, you know. Right. Is that what you mean when you say Sharon received the greater gift? Yeah, because she came into the fullness of the faith. She was always a good Baptist, but she... She wanted to be Catholic more than anything after this, after this, this birth, mm -hmm. uh, after this, um, this life, I mean. Now, one of the things you mentioned in the book, too, is something that's very dear in, uh, to all of us here at EWTM because of Mother Angelica. It's really talking about the sacrament of the present moment. Mother would always talk about mm -hmm. how important it is to live yeah. in the present moment. Why was that important to you? Well, the Catechism says, talks about the now offering. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's, there's always this 
passion that we're, we're kind of going through. There's always something going on in our lives. There's always this, um, this hour that we enter into, you know, and it, um, it just, it felt like a passion play in a way, you know. Now you as, as a father and as a man, obviously, you think about the fact that people say, and, and I guess in some ways today, you know, we're having the child. And in this case, also realizing that uh, we had the miscarriage. But do you think you were more profoundly affected in some ways than your wife was, or do you think it just affected you in different ways? Different ways, and I think it affected my wife more. I think she was the closest to mm -hmm. her in the-, in the Which would be natural, of yeah. course, right? And um, I, I, I guess I would say that, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what would you say to some other uh, families that are out there, and certainly men, uh, who are struggling with the same situation, whether it be that uh, they're afraid that this child who's on the way is going to be too much of an expense going forward, or maybe they're suffering over the fact of infertility or even the fact that, the, you know, they've lost a child. Well, a lot of things come down to age and money, mm -hmm. but none of us really know how long we're going to be here. And money, my father always gave more than others who had more to give. I, you know, it's... I don't know, Father Papa up at Human Life International used to say, uh, you know, kids don't care if they have pasta every night. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so, I mean, somehow things, things work out in that area, I think. Right, and at the end of the day, really most kids reflect back on what they really wanted with their parents and to have a good family life. Absolutely, and, and yeah. The, the, the tchotchkes and stuff seemed good at the time, but in retrospect, they realize as well. Well, thank you very much, Rob, for being so honest. What a pleasure. <laughs> and, uh, and, and sharing with us uh, your story, and Among Us is the title, First Fear, Then Miscarriage, A Catholic Father's Diary by Rob Gunn.